when we take all four plants together, we are uniting all four types of people, which includes everybody. So again, is that a little hokey? I mean, the lulav represents people who study, the esrug represents people who study and accept. Come on, what, what, what are we doing? What is the symbolism? And what is symbolism? It, 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 sounds, it sounds a little childish. So it's been Rosh Hashanah, it's been Yom Kippur. A lot has happened, a lot has changed. Now it's, Simcha, now it's Sukkot on the way to Simchas Torah. Sukkot in a sense is like a celebration of the success of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. God inscribed us for a good year. And then he sealed us for a good year on Yom Kippur. And now we have a year of mitzvahs of service, which we plan to do better than in the past. It's a celebration of a victory. And walking down the streets with your lulav held high is like a successful homecoming uh, parade, military parade. It's gonna be a good year. But the theme of almost everything on Sukkot is the oneness, the oneness of the people, one Jewish people. We see the oneness in the fact that the Gemara says or exclaims in a dramatic statement, all Jews are worthy of sitting in one sukkah. The sukkah is big enough, why not? There's no limit, there's no restriction on how large a sukkah can be. There's also the oneness represented by the four species. Each of the four species represents oneness and bringing them all together, uniting them, again, represents oneness. So let's take a quick look. There's the oneness of the lulav because the leaves grow very close to each other. I think eventually they open up and expand. But as the lulav, uh, as we're using it, all the leaves are flat against each other, as if there was just one solid piece. The myrtle, the hadassim, uh, have three leaves growing out of the same spot on the twig. The, uh, the arava, the willow, grow in very thick bunches, unusually close to each other. And the uh, esrog symbolizes oneness in that it stays on the tree the entire year which means it grows during the winter, it grows during the summer, it grows in the fall and it grows in the spring. Whatever the temperature, whatever the climate, the esrog combines them all and makes them all work for it. So it thrives in all four, so it unites all seasons in its, uh, in its development. So each of them separately, represents unity. When you take them all together, 
It is uniting those that are united. A double, a double oneness. So let's understand two things. First of all, what, is, what does it mean? This plant, because it grows in bunches or because it, the leaves are next to each other, we use it symbolically as a, doesn't that seem a little uh, pushing it a bit? It's just a plant. And it happens to grow this way. How significant, how important, how serious. Of course, we take ordinary things and we make a mitzvah out of it. But that's because we're using it to do what God commands us to do. But to say that it represents oneness, I'm sure we can find other things that also have an element of oneness. The other question is, what is the significance of all Jews could sit in one sukkah? All Jews could perform the mitzvah of hearing a shofar with one shofar. In other words, if the sukkah is big enough, all Jews can sit in the sukkah and be united in that way. Well, if the shofar is loud enough, all Jews can hear the blowing of, of, of a single shofar and fulfill the mitzvah, all of them together with one, with one performance. So what is so special about the sukkah that all Jews can sit in it? So the, the actual expression is ru'uyim kol Yisrael. All Jews are worthy of sitting in one sukkah, which means it's true that all Jews can fulfill the mitzvah of hearing the shofar with a single sounding of a single shofar, but they wouldn't be doing the mitzvah the same. It would be very different because it represents coronating God, it represents getting beyond ourselves, humbling ourselves. We can all hear the same shofar. We're not all going to have the same humbling effect. We're not all going to have the same coronating effect. There are people who are far advanced in, in their godliness, and there are those who are not so advanced. So yes, we can fulfill the mitzvah with one shofar but it's going to be noticeable for those who are, who are uh, experts on the subject. They'll, they'll, they'll be able to tell who was more affected by the chauffeur, who was less affected by the chauffeur. Because the chauffeur is a somewhat spiritual experience. Sitting in the sukkah, on the other hand, simply means sit in the sukkah the way you would sit in your home. And what do you do in the sukkah? Eat something. I don't know if there are people who are better at eating than others. Or better at sitting than others. The, the mitzvah of shofar is fulfilled primarily by our mind and heart. does not involve your feet or your hands. But sitting in the sukkah is the entire body, including the, the shoes or the boots that you're wearing. It is all included in the mitzvah of sitting in the sukkah. And if you're in Minnesota, you're wearing boots <laughs> and a sweater and an overcoat, and it's all part of the mitzvah. So, all Jews are worthy of sitting in the same sukkah is first of all because 
the mitzvah of sitting in the sukkah is an, is an equalizer. Nobody does it better than others. Every human being, certainly every Jew performing the mitzvah of sitting in a sukkah, is performing it exactly the same way as an, the greatest of tzaddikim. Now, it's true that the tzaddik will experience greater pleasure, uh, find more meaning, but that doesn't make the mitzvah greater. The mitzvah is to sit in the sukkah. The mitzvah of shofar is to do tshuva, to coronate God, to experience a, a humbling awe. Not everybody is going to do that equally. But the mitzvah of sukkah, we can all do equally. But even more than that, since it's after Yom Kippur, and we've all been forgiven, and we're all starting off with a clean slate, we are all worthy of sitting in the same sukkah. In terms of innocence, in terms of uh, closeness with God, after Yom Kippur, we are all equal in that we're all starting fresh. It was interesting that in 1973, Arab nations launched a war against Israel on Yom Kippur. And they thought that that would be to their advantage. Jews are in synagogues, you're not prepared. Of course, it turns out that because it was Yom Kippur, it worked in our, to our advantage. We were all deserving of an incredible miracle, which is exactly what happened. There was loss of life, but the miracle was of biblical proportions. Now, when you take the Lulav and the Esrog and you bring them all together inside of the Sukkah, you have layers of oneness. And, and there are different kinds of oneness. You can have oneness that is single-minded, of a single purpose. You can have oneness of brotherhood. Every Jew is equally precious as any other Jew to every Jew. That's a different kind of oneness. That we are all one in God's eyes. He sees us all as one people because we've cleaned our slates and we're all forgiven and we're all innocent is another kind of oneness. And you bring them all together, it's a really powerful event. But to understand the significance of these plants, is it that God gave these plants their nature and when he needed the mitzvah, of the four species, he picked these four because of the nature that they have. Or were they created to begin with for this purpose? Do they exist in this world specifically for this mitzvah? So the oneness that is represented in the way they grow or in the uh, the way the leaves develop, it's not a coincidence. It is oneness as expressed in the vegetable world. In general, we need to understand this idea. We don't begin with the existence of the world. Without Torah, that's what we would do. We know there's a world, we experience the world, we understand nature, we're part of nature, we're governed by nature. That's the reality of our situation. And philosophically, we dabble in godliness, we talk about God, we believe in God, 
we take a leap of faith in God, we debate God, but that's a whole different issue, a whole different reality. Our reality, we know, that reality we're not so uh, familiar with, maybe not even so sure about. That's not how you start. The beginning of everything is God. Because first, there was just him. He created a world. So what's more real, a creator or his creation? What's more alive, the painter or the painting? As alive as the painting appears to be, the figures are like jumping off the canvas. You can feel their emotions. You can, it's all amazing, but it's not as alive as the artist. So what's more real, that which always was or that which was produced at some point in time, at the beginning of time? So when we assume the reality of nature and we think about the reality of God, that's really not correct, not even sensible. God is for sure. Creation wasn't always. Will it always? Will it always be? If you ask the scientist, no, it won't. Torah says that God will never abandon his creation, which is good news. But that doesn't mean that the creation is by its nature eternal. It's not. God will continue to create the world out of nothing indefinitely, endlessly. But that's God doing it. It's not the truth or reality of nature, of existence. So everything that exists in this world, its reality began in the other world. It began in the world of real reality, real truth. And it devolved from there. So why is a red apple sweet? Because it devolves from the attribute of kindness. Why is a green apple tart? Because it devolves from the attribute of gvura, of uh, of judgment, severity. So what is sweetness in food or in, in a plant? It's an expression of the divine attribute of kindness. And what is the tartness or the sourness of an apple? It's the embodiment of the divine attribute of, of judgment. So when we dip an apple into honey, we dip a sweet apple. And honey itself is the physical embodiment of the attribute of kindness. So everything in this world has its nature from the source in the, in the godly world. So when God says, take this plant and uh, use it to create a oneness among people, bringing people together, it's actually effective. Like we're told that the lulav is a is a date palm branch and uh, the dates are tasty so they have good taste the um the myrtle does not taste good at all but it has a very pleasant smell people use it for besumen all year round 
the uh, willow has no taste, nor does it have a pleasant smell. The esrug has both a taste and a pleasant aroma. Smell and taste represent learning and mitzvahs. Study of Torah is the taste, the performance of mitzvahs are the smell. So the lulav represents a person who excels in the study of Torah, has a good taste. The willow, sorry, the, um, the myrtle represents a people who excel in good deeds, have a very good smell. The uh, esrog represents a person who is good at both, good smell and good taste. And the willow are the people who do not excel either in learning or in, in mitzvahs. The simple. When we take all four plants together, we are uniting all four types of people, which includes everybody. So again, is that a little hokey? I mean, the Lulav represents people who study. The Esra represents people who study and accept. Come on, what, what, what are we doing? What is the symbolism? And what is symbolism? It, it's, it, sounds, it sounds a little childish. But if we start with heaven and work our way down, then it makes a lot of sense. We want to bring together all kinds of people. Where in nature do we find that nature allows this kind of oneness? If you can bring together the palm and the, es and the citron and the myrtle and the willow, they are the results, they are the physical embodiment of those virtues as they start in heaven. You may have heard the story, but uh, when, when a little boy turns three, he gets his first haircut, the upsharing, and he's introduced to the Hebrew alphabet and to uh, Cheder. He's brought to the cheder, to the classroom, and the teacher um, teaches him the olive bays. And um, he, he licks the honey off of the letters that are written or covered with honey so that the letters are sweet to him. And uh, then we throw candies at him. And we tell him that the candies are from the angel Michal. It's an ancient Jewish custom. The Rebbe once asked, Adif Abrenin, how is it possible that a Jewish custom should be false? We're actually lying to the child. The father gets the candies. He throws the candies at the child while the child is covered with a talus. And we tell him that the angel threw the candies. That's a, that's a very bad uh, basis for education. It's not true. Kid is going to grow up and he's going to find out that it's not true. So the Rebbe explained, the sweetness of candy comes from heaven, from divine sweetness. But that sweetness comes down through many, many stages. There's the sweetness of godliness. God is good. There's the sweetness of an angel, the angel of kindness. There's the sweetness of intelligence. When, when we understand, when we can answer a question, 
it is sweet. There is the sweetness of good character. There is the sweetness of music, sound. And then there's the sweetness in the food product, in sugar, in fruit. So when we say to the child, the candy comes from the angel, Michal, who is the angel of kindness, it's true. It's more true than the fact that the father threw the candy. That's rather irrelevant. The father didn't create the candy, and even if he did, he didn't create sweetness. Sweetness is in sweetness in food is the final stage of the devolvement of sweetness from heaven down to earth. So rather than lying to the child, we're actually telling the child a divine uh, Kabbalistic truth. And as he grows older, he will appreciate the truth of it more and more, rather than discover that it's a falsehood. So when we begin our orientation towards reality with heaven, many things make sense. Things fall into place. It's uh, mentioned in Kabbalah that the reason we don't mix meat and milk is because meat and milk have different sources in their origins, and those don't mix, like kindness and severity. And so when we blend kindness and severity, that produces compassion. But when we just mix kindness and severity, that's chaos. And that's why there are people who are extremely kind. But their kindness is, is very self-conscious. They're very conscious of the fact that they're being kind. And they'll remind you, as they do you a favor, they will remind you how kind they're being. And they will expect a response, a reaction. Their kindness can actually cause people to suffer. So unless kindness is um, modified with wisdom or properly combined with judgment, it can be, it can be poisonous. The kindness can be. So mixing carelessly that which comes from severity and that which comes from, from kindness can be destructive. At any rate, the oneness that we see in this holiday is also expressed in the Rebbe's project for, from the beginning of, of his leadership of taking the Lul of Anesric to the streets and offering people in the street the opportunity to do the mitzvah. It is so appropriate, even more so than, uh, than Tfilin, because the theme of the day is that we are all one and it is expressed in these four species and it's expressed in bringing the four together so when we go out in the street, bringing Jews together, it is, it is guaranteed to uh, shake the heavens with the beauty of it and the power of it, the oneness of it. And that is a great way to start off the year. 
So we should have a year of real unity, not only for the Jewish people, but for everyone. It should be a year when the when the human race finally finds its its natural balance, not miraculous goodness, not 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 becoming religious and holy, just the natural balance of human beings. If you take away the eight Sahara, if you take away the ego, human beings are magnificent creatures and should be able to do magnificent things. And the fact that we're not is unnatural. So we need to find our true nature, find our true balance, and make the world what it's, what it's meant to be. I just want to mention a story, if I'm not mistaken. The Rebbe urged um, an American rabbi who was not a Chabad chassid in the, in the traditional sense of the word. He urged him to take a position as a rabbi in South Africa. This was in the 50s. And the Rebbe's argument was that if, he, if he's a rabbi here, he'll have a congregation. His influence won't go much further. He also wanted to move to Israel. The Rebbe said, there, your influence will be even more restricted. But in South Africa, you'll be able to affect the whole world. To this man's credit, he, he accepted the Rebbe's advice and he went and became the rabbi in, um, in South Africa. He was in New York visiting when he got a message from the Rebbe's office that he should call the uh, chief chaplain of the uh, prisons in South Africa and ask him why the Jews who are imprisoned don't have the right or the opportunity to put up a sukkah so that they can celebrate sukkahs. The Rebbe said, call him right now. But in, in South Africa, it was the middle of the night. And the Rebbe said, that's okay. He'll get the message that this is really urgent. Because if he approves it, it will become a template, it will become a, a basis for all other prisons all over the world to allow the Jewish inmates to have a sukkah. And, and that's what happened. But the story which you may have heard is about Jews, Hasidim in Russia under communism. To make a long story short, a Hasid by the name of Lazar was exiled to a place that the communists used as one of the forms of punishment and torture was to exile people to places that were uh, off the beaten path, where they knew no one, where no one could find them. There was no address, nobody knew where they were. One of these places uh, on the way to Siberia was where this laser was told to stay. That was his exile city. But you had to manage on your own. You had to find uh, you had to find dwelling, you had to get your own food. You just weren't allowed to leave the village. Anyway, he found a place that he could rent, but he was told that he would have to share it because someone was already in the apartment. Turns out that the person he was sharing it with was another chassid who had been arrested by the communists, and that was his... Um, exile city. So the two of them, of course, rejoiced. Great to have each other as company. And it was sukkah's time. The younger of them, Mayer, went and built a sukkah. 
doesn't take much, a couple of boards, loose pieces, some, some straw, some uh, corn stalks, and you have a sukkah. And sukkah's night, he was sitting in the sukkah with a little uh, vodka, and he started to sing and to fabring, but the older laser was a little more cautious, and he said, don't do this. The, uh, the policeman lives right across the street, and if we make a tumult, it'll get us into trouble. Mayor said to him, don't tell me you're afraid of them. They're nothing. It's yumta. Let's celebrate. The second night of Sukkot, Laser was convinced that Mayor was right. And so they uh, sat and they sang and they celebrated and then got up to dance with their eyes closed, with their arms on each other's shoulder. They were dancing round and round until the world disappeared and they were where they wanted to be. In the Yontif, the policeman came running to the landlord who they were renting the apartment from, who happened to be a Muslim. And he said, you know, you're going to get in trouble for hosting those parties. And the Muslim said, Muslims were not afraid of the communists. And the Muslim said, there's no party. It's just the two guys renting. He says, I don't believe you. Let's go take a look. They went to the back and they took a look and these two guys are just in, in, in another world. And the policeman said, what is going on? The Muslims said they're celebrating a holiday. And when they say celebrate a holiday, they forget about you and your prison and your weapons and your guns and your dogs. They're in a different world. You don't exist. Again, to make a long story short, after Yantif, this policeman was assigned a new job, and that is to be the third signature on the um, verdicts, on the judgments that uh, determined a prisoner's future. He was sitting in the office, and the secretary asked him to sign, and he saw that it was a decree, or it was the sentence for laser. And it said firing squad. And he thought, uh, people that holy, holy people should not be shot like dogs. It's not right. So he filled in another form. And instead of firing squad, he wrote 10 years hard labor. He got away with it somehow even though he was warned never to do that again. But they let it through. The next day, he told the landlord what had happened. You know, if I hadn't come across the street that night when they were singing, I wouldn't know that they were holy people. I thought they were just Zionists plotting to create a counter-revolution. But because you told me that they're holy people, this uh, laser is now still alive. Well, fast forward about 25 years and laser is allowed to emigrate from Russia to Israel. And of course, the first thing he does is he buys a ticket to come to New York to see the Rebbe. So he's in, he walks into 770 on the last day of Sukkot and he meets Mayor. Mayer had survived his exile. He had come to the, to the States years earlier. And Mayer said to him, remember you were afraid to sing on Sukkot because you thought it would get us into trouble? 
it saved your life. And he told Laser what had happened with the policeman who changed the forms. So celebrating on Sukkot, particularly in a Sukkah, this is bigger than life, more real than nature. So we should all have all rest of the Yom Tif, a very enjoyable, inspiring Simchas Torah, where the to not only will we be rejoicing with the Torah, glad to have the Torah, but the Torah will also rejoice with us. Torah is very glad to have us as its student and as its supporter and fulfiller. We practice it, we learn it, we keep it. Torah is thrilled. So again, it's a unite, it's a unifying joy. We're happy with the Torah, the Torah is happy with us, and is happy with both of us. So